Hi, everyone, and the people on Facebook Live as well. We're starting our restarting the program. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Rick Godley, who has an ENT practice in Providence, Rhode Island. If you don't know, the vernacular of that is otolaryngologist. Um, and he is going to talk about how migraine affects our bodies, but he is the founder of the Association of Migraine Disorders. He has developed an online module for education for primary care physicians. And this is going to be our big push. We have to get primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs treating headache because there is it is a crime for the few doctors, nurse, nurse practitioners, and PAs who know about headache. So thank you, Rick, for all you do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Um, and I need to try to move through this relatively quickly because we're running late and uh, it's very likely that I'm gonna add to that if we're not careful. So um, I will just mention uh, disclosures at my age, there's not much to reveal any longer, but uh, I, I, do, uh, I do have a little association with Amgen. If anyone else wants to hire me, uh, that's great. Uh, um, so uh, my job is to try to explain the brain, uh, and of course it's generally best known as a black box. So uh, in that black box uh, is this disease entity uh, of migraine uh, headaches, uh, which uh, really engenders a lot of questions. One is uh, what makes migraine different than other kinds of headaches. And as we know from the definition, it's pulsating head pain with light and noise sensitivity, nausea, or vomiting. So what really makes uh, migraine different than uh, other types of headaches, tension headaches and the such, is that it involves multiple parts of our nervous system. So uh, with, uh, now thankfully I don't suffer from uh, migraine headaches, but uh, the uh, uh, migraine attacks uh, are divided into phases, and those who are, are uh, experienced with this disease are probably have their own variations on this. But there's a prodrome in which there are some early signs of yawning and uh, sometimes hyperactivity. Uh, for a 30% uh, of migraine sufferers, there's an aura, which is uh, a uh, reversible uh, symptom, often visual. And then there is the migraine attack itself, which involves uh, intense head pain. And then that post when uh, sometimes there's a lingering headache, but also there's just these horrible other uh, symptoms that add to the misery of this disease. And why is migraine so different for different people? And why do people have symptoms that don't involve headaches? And why do people have different symptoms at different times in their lives? We know that there's a, now uh, a number of people who have uh, colic in childhood who go on to develop uh, migraine um, disease at a much higher rate than, uh, than those who do not. And uh, children often have manifestations of abdominal pain, uh, muscle spasms, and motion intolerance. Uh, but in puberty, the, uh, the disease usually reveals itself uh, primarily as a headache disease. And why do headaches change during a person's life? So symptoms often increase in severity and frequency, and they move from episodic to chronic. And why is migraine so different for women? Obviously, there's, uh, it strikes uh, most severely during the most productive uh, years of life. And why is migraine uh, so disabling for people? Uh, and that's uh, primarily not only the headaches, but uh, many of the associated issues around uh, how well their brain is working. So that's thinking, sleeping, their moods. And why are they, there are these comorbidities? So uh, people have a, a second associated chronic disease. In fact, those with chronic migraine disease, 80% of them have at least one, if not more, comorbid diseases. And why is that? 
So an example of that is the high prevalence of mood disorders. Uh, those with migraine have two to three times the rate of depression and five times the rate of anxiety. So how are we gonna explain all the complexity of this disease? Well, it's certainly complicated. <laughs> And I'm gonna not try to make this too sugar-coated, but uh, so buckle up and uh, let me see if I can take you through some of the basics. So the easiest way for me to think of, of this is as a wiring system. And the primary wire is uh, the nerve cell called a neuron and a uh, nerve cell uh, has uh, an arborization, hence the name dendrites. So it's like trees out in the wind collecting information. And then that brings that information to the cell and sends it out along a, a long piece of spaghetti called an axon. And some of these axons are quite long. They'll go the length uh, of a leg, for instance. On the tips of those trees are, uh, or dendrites, as uh, the official word for that is a variety of receptors. So ways to measure uh, pain, coolness, uh, touch, pressure, and heat. And those uh, pain sensors, which one can often hear the technical word nociceptors, uh, collect that information and send it uh, to the axon, which uh, moves it to the next cell. And that's the beginning of what we call the pain pathway. So looking specifically at how this cell functions, well, there's first a, an electrical uh, aspect of it. So the sensor starts a process by which the information or message is sent along the length of that cell. And that is an electrical uh, charge. And that electrical charge is created by these little charged ions. So very familiar things like salt or potassium. So that could be a sodium or potassium salt. And uh, when they live alone, they have a little charge on them and the body takes advantage of that by having a differential across the cell membrane of having more charges on one side or the other. And that actually makes a little electric signal. Oops. So let's see if that's gonna work. No, that's not gonna, that's, uh, just would show you an animation of, the, uh, of how these ions travel through channels in the uh, membrane. And these, these little channels are all along the surface of the neuron. So they get to the end of the axon and they've got to tell the next guy, so the relay has to be carried uh, on. And here there is a chemical process and this is where you hear about things like, called neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are uh, stored, they're little, little molecules, and they're uh, stored in small uh, little balloons, which are called vesicles, uh, at the end of the axon. And when a very specific ion channel, which is a calcium one, it comes into action, gets the, that electric signal, comes down, they open up and they flood the cell with calcium, that tells the, the cell to release these vesicles. And the vesicles uh, cross into a small space between uh, the axon and the next uh, dendrite. And uh, that's called a synapse. And on the other side of that is, are some very specialized proteins that are embedded in the membrane, which are the receptors. And those molecules fit into the receptor. And, tell it to continue the signal to the next cell. So this is what it sort of looks like as a cartoon. All right. Unfortunately, this pain pathway has a lot more complexity. So let me start to uh, give you some of that complexity. One is that the, basically those nerve fibers come in different varieties, depending on how much myelin they have on them. Now, myelin is a sort of fatty material that can is like insulation around the, the axons, and it makes for a more efficient 
uh, transfer of that electric signal. So those, uh, those nerve fibers that have uh, myelin on them allow the signals to travel much quicker. So uh, there are examples of pain where you have an immediate uh, uh, pain and then uh, there's also delayed pain. And those are the unmyelinated cells, the C cells. Also, in those synapses, there are different neurotransmitters and different receptors. So you can sort of imagine that they're like a different set of uh, locks and keys because they're very specific for uh, which uh, receptors they're going to bond with. But there are often uh, uh, transmitters that will uh, can attach to more than one uh, receptor, and so uh, it's not always a one-to-one -one relationship. And this gives you an idea that in, uh, in the pain pathway alone, there are many uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, I will also make a, a point here that there are, uh, we distinguish endogenous ones, uh, around uh, issues like opioids and cannabinoids, which simply means that the body makes something equivalent to an opio opioid or a cannabinoid. So there are a number of other uh, receptors on the other end. And to give you another level of sophistication of how the system works, there are additional synapses that, uh, sorry, there are additional axons that come into play in the synapse that can add more than one neurotransmitter. So these are either uh, exciting or inhibiting uh, the, this chemical process. So these are called modulators. They uh, can slow up or, or make uh, or dampen down or uh, make pain signals more intense. So once we've got the signal coming uh, into the spinal cord, uh, the first stop uh, on the way to the brain is in the brain stem. There, there are a number of uh, consolidated uh, nerve uh, cell bodies, which are each called uh, nuclei. And the brain stem is known for having a number of nuclei which are serving different functions. So the nuclei talk to each other. So if we use our wiring analogy, this is uh, where there's a lot of interconnections between uh, the signals. So this is just pointing out some of the structures uh, of the uh, brain stem. And this is just a uh, written uh, a description of some of the major areas uh, of the brainstem that are involved in the pain uh, pathway. And one of the great functions of the brainstem nuclei is to cool down the system. So it modulates often in a dampening uh, fashion, but it also connects to many other uh, body functions hearing, balance, fatigue, sleep, and thinking. And the brainstem distributes pain information uh, to other, not only to other parts of the brainstem, uh, but to the uh, cortex or the brain, or what we think often is the brain. So the last stop in the brainstem is uh, at the top, and this are, uh, these are the structures of the hypothalamus and the thalamus, which uh, are relatively uh, large uh, groupings of, uh, of nuclei. And they have very specific functions. Uh, the hypothalamus uh, exerts a number of non-painful influences on this uh, pain process. Uh, and they, it uh, is where it, uh, the pain pathway often engages with the autonomic nervous system. So that word means that it's operating on its own uh, and without conscious thought. So the parts of the autonomic system are what makes your belly work without having to think about digesting food. 
or in my case, as an ENT doctor, it accounts for uh, what makes our nose stuffy or it makes it run. Then there's uh, neurohormones. So uh, there's uh, a number of uh, hormones that have effect on uh, our body that uh, both on a neurologic level as well as other uh, organs in the body. Uh, the hypothalamus is well known for uh, controlling things about how we're feeling also. Body temperature, hunger, thirst, uh, circadian rhythms, sleep, and fatigue. The thalamus is uh, a bit more of a relay station, uh, but it has some important nuclei in there. Uh, and it also uh, has effects over how alert we feel and sleepiness. So just to think about it, uh, a way to remember this is that uh, the brainstem is a bit of the gossip center. This is where a lot of uh, signals are shared and spread uh, and adds to the uh, incredible variety of this, of the way this disease uh, manifests itself. itself. So after the brainstem, the signals are sent to the cortex. And in the cortex, uh, there are, again, uh, a whole host of, uh, of neurons. To give some perspective on this, uh, it's been estimated at 100 billion neurons. So that has been compared to the number of trees uh, in the Amazon basin. And it's not only neurons, but there are these supporting cells called glial cells, of which there are four major groups. Uh, some of them are simply uh, helping to create the division uh, between what is inside the brain or outside, called the blood-brain barrier. Others produce the myelin, uh, or, uh, or they uh, produce the cells that are like an epithelial uh, uh, separation. And finally, the microglia. Now, the microglia are particularly interesting. They make up about 15% of the cells in the brain and they, in the cortex, and they um, are uh, involved in the immune system. So we will be getting back to the little pesky microglia in a minute. So the brain is also divided into sections and has different functions. And this is just a depiction of uh, how this information flows up uh, from below and then is uh, distributed uh, into different parts of the uh, cortex uh, and creating uh, different uh, pathways and patterns. And uh, the uh, areas that are divided into uh, some that are more mood related and others are more sensory uh, related. Um, an example of this is the insula, which regulates body homeostasis. We've discussed this briefly about the brainstem, but here again, emotions get involved, perceptions. Uh, um, so it would account perhaps for uh, when uh, Alice in Wonderland, when people feel their limbs are different size uh, than, they, uh, than they are in reality, uh, how they're thinking, and audiovisual issues. And then, of course, there are differences uh, in the brain by gender. Um, there uh, is strong evidence that women experience pain more intensely. And there's also differences in neural activity, connections and cellular density uh, between men and women, but also women who have migraine and women who do not have migraine. So to recap, here we have a, a, a very simple illustration of how the traditional pain pathway starts with uh, triggering uh, uh, touch or heat uh, and sending that signal up through uh, the uh, spinal cord to the brain and on to uh, its various components. But migraine is slightly different. Migraine's emphasis is 
more on a specific uh, nerve, the trigeminal nerve. I'm sure most people are familiar with this, but uh, for me it's of great interest because the emphasis has often been on the first branch of the trigeminal nerve, which give headaches in the temples and, uh, and more of the scalp area, but it also is innervating uh, the mid face, uh, the sinuses, and the lower branch, the dentition, uh, uh, and those areas uh, have manifestations of migraine disease. The other thing about the trigeminal nerve is that it is uh, inappropriately, or no, I shouldn't say inappropriately, but disproportionately uh, represented in the cortex. So this little character uh, is called the homunculus, uh, and it is just a visual uh, representation of how many cells are devoted to the head and neck area in a person's brain. And so from this, you can see that 40% of the brain is uh, committed to an area, of sur a body surface area of only about 10%. So we feel uh, and experience life a lot more intensely when it comes to our head. Okay, well, we're not gonna be able to tell all the secrets here, but uh, so this is, uh, so the question is what can go wrong with this? Well, migraine disease is really a disease of altered uh, thresholds of activating uh, pain. And uh, so uh, when people uh, experience migraine disease, that uh, sensitivity uh, to triggering uh, pain pathways is much lower. So the goal of treatment is to raise that, that sensitivity uh, again. And that can be done through lifestyle changes, but also medications. So this is just a illustration of uh, how the, uh, supposed to depict how overly reactive the brain is when it gets charged uh, up with a migraine attack. And what is different about migraine is that it has a much wider range of invisible, uh, invisible triggers, uh, food, light, stress, uh, lack of sleep, odors, and weather. The, uh, to de uh, describe what our understanding of a migraine attack is, it starts uh, with actually the meningeal surface around the brain, which has sensors that are attached to the trigeminal nerve. And those signals come in through the trigeminal nerve, work their way up uh, through the brainstem uh, until they get to an area that uh, is considered the migraine center. Uh, sort of in the uh, midbrain area, uh, and it triggers uh, a, uh, a wave of electrical activity across the surface of the cortex cor called a cortical spreading depression. So this is sort of a depiction of what that might look like, uh, although uh, this is hard to measure, and it's usually associated with uh, aura. So aura, is, as I said before, is only really a third of migraine uh, patients. With a migraine attack, we, uh, there is actually evidence that is, uh, on functional MRI, which allows you to see the different parts of the brain activity and how it shifts during the process of a migraine attack. And uh, it is followed by uh, a process of neuroinflammation. So this is where those microglia cells are coming into action. Those cells are triggered during that electric storm uh, to release a lot of uh, neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters in turn stimulate inflammatory mediators, uh, which are called cytokines and chemokines. And they, they in turn cause blood vessels to dilate uh, fluid to leak out of the, uh, the vessels and cause swelling or edema of the brain. And this is often referred to easily uh, in a more easy term of inflammatory soup. So it's 
Uh, there's evidence that this inflammatory reaction that happens at the end of each migraine attack uh, actually is causing lasting damage to the nerves uh, of the brain. And this is called chronification. This is one of the reasons why uh, physicians try to get uh, patients with migraine to treat their disease, uh, their headaches, each time it, it happens, to be aggressive, because we're trying to uh, control this neuroinflammatory reaction. So this is a nice way of trying to show this. And I'm going to say that my time is going to be up here, so I don't know whether uh, People want to grab food and hear some more because I actually have uh, some other information uh, which might be of interest. Uh, so is there interest in that? Because I don't want to steal from your lunchtime, but if, uh, if you want to take a, a break and get some food, I'd be glad to continue if that's okay with the hierarchy here. I'm not the boss. That's, I got the thumbs up on that. So. Why doesn't everyone just take a break at this point and uh, I'd be happy to, to talk during lunch. So here we see a diagram of neuroinflammation. And uh, that inflammatory process can lead to this process of chronification. Uh, it's a slow, progressive uh, damage to the uh, neurons of the cortex. Uh, and it's been estimated that two to three percent uh, of patients with episodic migraine transform into chronic migraine every year. The most common symptoms we see from uh, this progressive uh, injury to the brain is uh, allodynia. And this is when pain is induced by non-painful stimuli or hyperalgesia, which is excess excessive sensitivity to stimulus. Uh, the good news is that there's also evidence this does not have to be a completely permanent uh, condition and uh, it uh, has been shown to be reversible. Uh, it does leave behind some telltale signs uh, on MRIs, uh, one finds these non-specific uh, white matter changes. Uh, there are other causes for this, uh, but presumably some of this vascular scarring uh, does leave uh, a white uh, uh, areas in the brain that are not normal. So one way to think about chronification uh, is that it really changes the sensitivity of the trigeminal nerve and other uh, special sensory pathways. Uh, so in some cases, it doesn't seem as if you actually even need an external stimulus uh, to uh, produce uh, neurologic activity. Um, and one way that I like to conceptualize this uh, is that this is like having a fire alarm that is going off uh, inappropriately. So what I mean by that is that uh, I see patients uh, who have uh, sensations of sinusitis or vertigo uh, without any necessary stimulus, but uh, they don't fit into other criteria. They don't respond to antibiotics. Their CT scans are normal uh, and uh, they do respond to migraine medications. So we've moved now from having a black box to something more like Swiss cheese. We have some information, but in fact, there's a good deal of uh, unanswered questions. Uh, if we're looking at uh, the uh, template of cortical spreading depressions, we don't really know uh, how they start. And uh, we, don't really understand exactly what's happening during this inflammatory process. Uh, and this uh, model is really designed for patients with auras. Uh, and so there's, uh, we don't know exactly what's happening for the vast majority of migraine patients. I'd also like to go on to try to explain why there's so many shades of migraine. 
First of all, as we've heard, uh, migraine is an inherited disease. Well, what does that mean? Uh, so genes uh, are really important because of not only when you're first formed, but throughout your life, they are replenishing uh, cells. So they're making proteins. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, an error in, in that process, uh, you have chronically uh, uh, errors in your uh, nervous system. So is there evidence of this in migraine? Well, in a very rare form of migraine, there is very strong evidence because uh, three uh, genetic mutations uh, have been identified uh, that explain uh, that uh, disease process. But for the vast majority of migraine patients, unfortunately, there aren't specific uh, gene mutations that uh, explain what's going on. And instead, uh, there's this concept of susceptibility genes. So these are genes that predispose uh, one to a disorder. Uh, and so uh, while you can have a susceptibility gene and still not have migraine, it uh, does put you at a greater risk uh, of that condition. One way to think of this is uh, as a deck of cards in which you get uh, dealt uh, different hands each time. And depending on that combination of cards, uh, your migraine disease might look different uh, than the next person, even within families. So these susceptibility genes affect a good number of uh, components of the nervous system, and that includes ion channels, transmitters, receptors, mitochondria, and a number of vascular uh, issues. If, you, if this is correct, uh, this concept of having uh, you know, your individual uh, array of susceptibility genes that you're living with can explain why, for instance, 40% of any medication or treatment is going to fail because it's not addressing all of the different possible causes for your problem. Uh, and it also explains differences between family members. So if we look at one of these conditions, uh, mitochondria, which one might not associate with migraine disease, but it's the battery pack of the cell. And there have been uh, genetic susceptibilities uh, identified with this. Uh, and perhaps the best proof that this seems to be related closely to migraine is that a number of medications, including riboflavin, uh, coenzyme Q10, magnesium, and topiramate, all address issues around mitochondrial function. Susceptibility genes, though, seem to uh, predominantly affect uh, the, how the function of neurotransmitters and receptors. Um, so let's, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, those uh, uh, entities, and uh, there are a few important uh, understandings of how they work in the pain systems. Uh, one is that transmitters and receptors can either decrease uh, pain and be inhibitory or increase pain, in which case they're excitatory. These neurotransmitters and receptors uh, are found in different parts of the nervous system. It's not all uniform. And uh, throughout the, the system, they also serve different functions in different pathways. And this can explain why uh, a medication that helps uh, uh, can also harm because it can have side effects, unexpected side effects. And uh, finally, the genetic defects may affect a portion uh, or the entire system. And if it is overlapping with other uh, conditions, this might be an explanation for the uh, comorbidities uh, that may be explained by susceptibility genes. So if we look at some of these specific uh, 
uh, neurotransmitters there. Uh, serotonin is a good example of some of those rules that I went over. Uh, it has complex pathways uh, that relate to mood, memory, sleep, thinking, as well as pain. Serotonin, uh, when we're talking about migraine disease, plays uh, an inhibitory role. And it does that uh, in two ways. One is it, uh, it constricts blood vessels, which uh, when one has a migraine attack, migraine, uh, the blood vessels tend to swell uh, and, that, and also get leaky, so there's edema, and uh, that's part of the pain that's associated with uh, migraine uh, attack. Also, higher levels of serotonin inhibit the release of CGRP and substance P, which are also neurotransmitters that are excitatory. So if you can calm them down, the attacks are less severe. Getting into the complexity of this, that there are 11 different subtypes of serotonin receptors. So it, when we talk about migraine, it actually is only uh, uh, one small portion of the serotonin system that we're talking about. But it's an important one because triptans have their intervention uh, with two of these receptors. But there's also hope for drugs like psilocybin, which uh, can block uh, one of the other receptors. And we hope uh, to find that that could be an effective treatment. And one can see that uh, certain serotonin uh, receptors are associated with depression. So this gives you an idea of the comorbidity. Uh, norepinephrine uh, plays an inhibitory uh, role also with pain, uh, as as we've seen with uh, serotonin. Dopamine is another one of these neurotransmitters that's very complicated. Uh, it affects many different parts uh, of our function. Uh, but specifically for migraine, it plays a, quite an important part during uh, what we think of as cortical spreading depression and the uh, arc of, uh, of pre and post ictal uh, symptoms. It also uh, is associated with co comorbid diseases of rest restless leg syndrome. Uh, and uh, it explains how some anti-emetic medications, which have uh, suppressed the dopaminergic system, also help with pain. Uh, so that's the beauty of, of uh, being able to use uh, something like uh, clopromazine uh, to su suppress both the nausea, vomiting, and pain. And there are some uh, aspects of the, these systems that are yet to be worked out. Uh, one of the new theories is that there are dopamine receptors on lymphocytes and that they may be playing uh, a part that we didn't uh, appreciate before. And uh, to go through some of the other neurotransmitters more quickly, there's glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So those are sort of the bad guys. Um, and uh, they have a very uh, specific uh, receptor, uh, which is called uh, abbreviated uh, NMDA receptor. Uh, but receptors can respond to different uh, 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 transmitters, uh, and uh, so it can be complicated that way. Uh, let me also mention that uh, there's some uh, medications that can uh, block this receptor, which we hope will uh, one day be therapeutic. And uh, GABA is an inhibitory uh, transmitter, and it often is at work in the same synapses uh, as glutamate. So, uh, they're working at odds with each other. Uh, and it's, in fact, this system in which this new postpartum depression drug is working. Substance P is an excitatory 
uh, neurotransmitter, works alongside with glutamate in many of the synapses. This is a, one of the receptors where uh, substance P uh, works, and uh, it causes inflammation because it's excitatory. So I've been running through these just to give you an idea of how many different uh, types of uh, both uh, neurotransmitters and receptors are people are now working on in research to see if there's other ways that uh, one might be able to control migraine disease. Uh, obviously, the one that has been so successful recently is blocking uh, calcitonin gene-related peptide, better known as CGRP. So this is uh, works in the trigeminal system, and it's the principal neurotransmitter there. So it sensitizes the body to pain and dilates uh, blood vessels. So if you can uh, block it, you really can control a lot of the symptoms. There are two forms of it, which we don't need to go into, but one is, uh, is uh, in the sensory system and one is in the GI system. And when we talk about the new medications uh, that have been developed to try to correct this problem, there have been two approaches. Uh, one is to actually bind and block and inactivate CGRP itself, and the other is to block the receptor. And so this is one of the reasons that the side effects for these uh, three drugs are slightly different and also why they're uh, different uh, efficacy um, because they are working in different ways. They also bring up this issue of uh, the blood-brain barrier. So here you, the system uh, we have in our body is that there's a pretty tight wrapping around uh, the, the, the brain to protect it from a lot of uh, things that we don't want affecting our nervous system. Uh, but that also poses a challenge when we're trying to get medications uh, into that space. Uh, it's particularly uh, tough for large molecules and the CGRP monoclonal antibodies that are blocking that, uh, that neurotransmitter are quite large. So it's pretty well uh, assumed that they're not getting into the, into the brain. So that in and of itself means that it may limit how much they can work and why other um, options such as g pants are may potentially be appealing if they can get across that blood-brain barrier. And then we have the endogenous, which means it's the opioids that we make in our own body, um, which is a powerful system. Uh, obviously, uh, the uh, exogenous forms of opioids have a terribly addictive uh, uh, issue that's related to them, uh, but there still may be other uh, formulations that can be made and there are now researchers working on this, uh, which might be able to block these receptors uh, in without some of the um, tough side effects. And there are other, uh, other targets out there. Uh, I just mentioned this receptor, uh, which is a channel, uh, like ion channel, uh, and it uh, accelerates the, uh, the signaling around pain. So if one could block this, uh, it would be another strategy for controlling migraines. And there's a lot of interest now in cannabinoids. So as many people uh, probably know, as discussed earlier today, there uh, are two main cannabinoids. Uh, one, uh, would be uh, THC and the other would be CBD. And uh, uh, there's now a great interest in trying to figure out what kind of ratio do you need between those to be most effective? What's the dosing uh, to really take this uh, to a more scientific level? Because right now the debate is lost in uh, a lot of 
uh, uh, questions of having uh, access for recreational uses, and it has slowed down treating this more as a medication, which it has this great potential to be. So cannabinoids are another uh, suppressive of pain signaling. And I will uh, skip these issues. Oxytocin, I just mentioned, uh, because there is medication that uh, is coming onto the market now. It's a pain inhibitor. There's a possibility that we'll be able to offer this as a nasal spray. Uh, one of my favorite topics is estrogens. Uh, again, very complicated because estradiol, which is the predominant uh, form of estrogen, uh, has many metabolites. And those metabolites uh, can function in uh, several different ways. One is that they can actually, uh, there are receptors uh, in the nucleus, which means that it can affect DNA. Uh, but there are also receptors on the cell surface, so they are going to be affecting other parts of the cell function. And they work also uh, much like a neurotransmitter or a neuromodulator. Uh, so clinically, we see that uh, the effects of estrogen are very complicated. Uh, there are uh, some uh, women who respond to various, uh, to different levels of estradiol than others uh, and how it affects the migraine. But in general, uh, high levels and very low levels of estradiol uh, can, uh, can protect uh, against headaches. It's really the fluctuations that can be a problem. So if you'll hold your question, uh, I'm almost at the end. So I'm just gonna recap that there's these excitatory uh, neurotransmitters and receptors and the inhibitory ones and estradiol sort of uh, serves uh, both camps. So I'm just gonna have a quick uh, overview of uh, a couple other topics and then we'll wrap it up. The, uh, there is one, a question of how do we study uh, this the, the migraine is really really tough to study in, in humans, but there have been advances now uh, beyond just having MRIs. There's functional MRIs which allow you to see processes at work, and we saw some examples of that earlier. And there's head scanners and with various tracers, so you can mark uh, cells and and, uh, and uh, figure out uh, where they're concentrated and when they're at work. And then finally, we, uh, there are a number of uh, animal models that have been developed. So we also, there's sort of reverse understanding uh, with some of these medications, which help us understand uh, how the system works uh, when they get introduced into the market. And we'll see this probably with the CGRP blockers as we see some of the side effects. We actually learn more about CGRP. And I had this image of the soup bowl in which uh, someone is adding uh, some spices, but um, it's in some ways helpful to think of the, uh, this biology as something where we are trying to supplement uh, a, uh, a part of it that's not working well. So, uh, there are uh, several of these medications, which I'm going to point out uh, quickly how they seem to work. Uh, when we take ibuprofen, it's actually uh, working on prostaglandins because prostaglandins are sensitized pain receptors, make them worse, and they also have an effect on serotonin. So indirectly, you, uh, if you can block the production of uh, uh, prostaglandins, it, it's a way of controlling pain. And tryptans uh, work uh, by uh, several mechanisms, but they work primarily, as we saw, on serotonin receptors. Uh, and 
um, and thereby uh, are uh, blocking uh, this excitatory uh, uh, neurotransmitter. No, uh, sorry, uh, it's an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, ergots work the same way. Uh, tricyclic uh, antidepressants uh, also work on the serotonin system and uh, the opioid system as well. Beta uh, blockers are interesting because they're working more on the vascular system, but uh, how they are effective is still unclear. And topiramate uh, blocks sodium channels, so that's uh, affecting the transmission of the signals, so it's dampening down the signaling, and it works on uh, GABA, which is uh, increasing its activity because it's inhibitory, and suppressing glutamate, which is an excitatory uh, uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll leave you with the fact that uh, we focused on the pain uh, pathways, but uh, it's further complicated by uh, the fact that migraine disease is affecting the vestibular system and the auditory system. Uh, so uh, some of the topics that we've uh, uh, touched on also affect tinnitus, uh, auditory processing disorder, which simply is a fancy word for meaning you can hear words but not always understand what people are saying. It affects uh, visual parts here, light sensitivity, dry eye, so they're all neurologic bases for these uh, symptoms. And uh, so I hope that this is uh, helpful for people to understand these odd symptoms that they get ear pressure, uh, feelings that something is in their ear canal. These are all because your nervous system is misfiring, giving you false information. So I'll close the end that uh, this question that I've presented a bunch of dots uh, of knowledge and hopefully you can step back and start to see the trees uh, from that. So thank you very much for joining me today. All right.